thanks so much for joining us uh, and uh, being here. This is our first ever fellowship uh, question and answer uh, Stanford Department of Medicine uh, Zoom webinar. Uh, we've been doing this for years for the residency program. And uh, this is our first time doing it for the fellowship. The purpose of this is essentially to get you guys uh, a better understanding or to learn anything you'd like to learn directly from our fellows. Um, many of you on this have actually been invited or have come or will come for a fellowship interview. Uh, we do open this up to everybody to learn more about Stanford, but we specifically want um, people who may come here in the future to know this place as good as possible. So thanks so much for joining us. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to go around and ask everybody on the panelist group to spend a minute or so introducing themselves. Uh, I'm Ray Han. Um, I, I'm in the adult and pediatric endocrinology division. I've had type 1 for 30 years myself, um, but I basically moved from engineering to medicine when my two younger sisters got type 1. Um, I was fortunate enough to be offered a medpeds endocrine uh, position over here and there are faculty on both sides working in diabetes technology and working with industry. Hi everyone, my name is Anna Pacheco Navarro. I'm one of the pulmonary critical care fellows. It's my first year of fellowship here at Stanford um, and previously was at Mass General Hospital for residency. Um, and then in terms of my interests, I think I'm really, you know, I'm early in fellowship and really trying to decide whether I'm going to be more clinically or research focused. Um, I do have a teaching background. I was a New York City public school teacher for several years um, prior to going into medicine. So um, medical education has long been an interest. Hi, everyone. Um, I go by Zoe for short, but my full name is Chiazotame Kekezia. I did my residency and my chief year at Brown. Um, I am a first year fellow in gastroenterology and hepatology. Um, started out in a completely different area uh, in medical anthropology and jazz. Um, so shout out to the fact that Stanford loves people who I think have uh, very, you know, different interests. Um, I am undifferentiated at this time as far as whether or not I'm going to be more clinical or research oriented. Um, and one of the things I really love about my program is that they haven't really forced me yet to decide. So. Hello, hi, I'm Gladys Rodriguez. I am a first year Hemonc fellow. Um, and I uh, did residency at UCSF. And then I did one year as a hospitalist at UCSF in the BMT service. I am uh, interested overall in disparities work. Um, and I am currently in the research track in my fellowship. Excellent. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is EBA Okindaye. I'm actually in the nephrology department as a second year, and I'm doing my postdoctoral fellowship. So my area of interest is women's health, particularly um, understanding fertility and pregnancy issues among women with chronic kidney disease. So I'm having a lot of fun. Joining us on the phone is Henry. Hi, how are you? Uh, my name is Henry Zhang. I'm currently a palliative, hospice and palliative care medicine fellow uh, with Dr. Perry Aquil. I finished my emergency medicine residency at the University of Miami. And before I used to work in construction for three years. Oh, wow, that's pretty cool. Thanks, Henry. <laughs> so those are our, our current fellows. Um, I'd also like to next introduce Dr. Pericoil, VJ Pericoil. She's the fellowship director for the palliative care medicine program. And she's actually the reason we're doing this uh, event today. It was her idea. She wanted to uh, create an event like this so prospective fellows can learn more about our program and dispel any myths and really learn how wonderful, no bias, but hopefully you learn how wonderful it can be to, to work over at Stanford. So Vijay, I'll turn over to you to introduce yourself as well. Yeah. Hi. Thanks so much, Harold, for, uh, for that um, overview. So uh, my name is Vijay Peria Coyle. I am actually a past Stanford fellow. And so I'm one of those who graduated and then failed to leave the nest. So here I am. My background is geriatrics and uh, palliative care. And uh, informed consent is really important, right? Before you all decide to come to Stanford, which we hope all of you do, it's really important for you to be able to speak with our fellows, our chair, our vice chair, and Errol, who's our director of communication, so you can get the inside scoop. So please ask all your questions. And thanks so much for being here. Thanks, VJ. We're lucky to have Dr. Verghese and Dr. Harrington. To my side here is uh, Dr. Abraham Verghese. I'll have him say a few words. Hi there, everybody. Um, I'm Abraham Verghese. I'm the Vice Chair for Education. So I've been here about a dozen years, and uh, by training, I'm uh, trained both in infectious disease and pulmonary medicine. But really what I do most of all is um, 
oversee the care of the medical students and the residents. We've gotten very interested in trying to uh, create a fellows college and create a better experience overall for fellows uh, at Stanford. They've over, always had a fabulous experience, but uh, to foster a bigger sense of community. So I'm really excited to be you know, working with BJ and uh, so many of the other fantastic people you're going to meet shortly uh, who are really making this uh, our major uh, area of concern. So uh, look forward to your questions. Thanks, Dr. Vergis. And, uh, uh, and then we have Dr. Harrington. I, I mentioned earlier that uh, we've been doing this for a few years for the residency program. It was actually Dr. Harrington's idea to do a, a webinar like this that we've been doing for so many years. So uh, he has, always has great ideas of always looking at ways to reach out to the trainees. Uh, Dr. Harrington? So thanks, Earl, and uh, thanks to all the folks who have joined us on the line today, including my, uh, my Stanford colleagues. Uh, as Earl said, my name is Bob Harrington. I am the uh, chair of medicine here at Stanford. I'm trained as a uh, interventional cardiologist. I now practice general cardiology. I do clinical research. And uh, as I said, I help to uh, oversee uh, the activities of the department, including all the educational activities. I'm excited to uh, be part of the panel today. As Errol said, we've been doing this for a few years for the residency applications. And I think that's been helpful both to the applicants, but also to those of us who are responsible for the running of the program. So I look forward to participating and uh, Special thanks to the fellows who've joined us and thank you, Errol, Abraham, and VJ for uh, your leadership. Thanks again, Dr. Harrington. Um, and for the uh, uh, attendees, again, um, those of you who've put in questions, thank you. We have a number of fellowship programs. What, most of our goal is not less to, not so much to answer specific questions to any program. If you do have those questions, we're happy to connect you uh, to get those questions answered in the future. Uh, but more about generally working at Stanford, training the culture, the patient population, research, anything along those lines. But please ask any question that comes to mind, and we'll do our best to get them answered with our group. How bad is it actually for someone to survive and support oneself on ACGME guided fellowship salary? Um, so one of the nice things is Stanford is probably amongst the most generous in terms of salary to begin with for, for fellowships. So that helps tremendously. In addition, uh, we get housing stipends as fellows uh, to help cover the cost. Uh, people don't uh, always live in that central campus housing. Through the years of fellowship, I've seen a lot of people who live in like Menlo Park or uh, Redwood City. Some of us live more inland. I'm in Sunnyvale, uh, others in, in Mountain View. And it, while it is uh, expensive, obviously, um, you know, it's not necessarily not comparable to other big, big metro areas in the country. Um, so I think that was one of my concerns when I came here. Um, I was coming from Boston, which isn't a cheap place, as you all know. Um, but I still was worried about, you know, just the cost of rent and everything else. And I will say that in addition to the housing st uh, stipend, which is quite generous, Stanford does everything it can to throw money at its house staff, which is, um, it's very generous. There's a number of other stipends, like there's a cell phone stipend. There's all sorts of extra money that you get in bits and pieces. Um, and I think that that just, essentially it looks like Stanford's looking for ways to give us extra money and to make this more doable. And um, as Rayhan alluded to, you know, sometimes it is a matter of trade-offs. So for me, my priority in my first year of fellowship was to be as close to the hospital as possible. So I'm living here in Palo Alto um, and I find that very doable, but I am living in a studio. Um, for people who have families or, you know, partners or dogs or, you know, maybe space is the biggest, you know, the most important priority. And, you know, I have friends who are living in much larger apartments, but, you know, maybe um, one or two suburbs down. So, um, you know, 20 to 30 minute drive. Um, so I think it's, it's very doable. Um, you may need to make some compromises, but um, once you're here, the Bay Area is, is quite doable and, and there's you know, wealth of things to do that are that are reasonably uh, affordable. 
Um, so I feel like I live very comfortably coming from Providence, Rhode Island or the East Coast. I was really nervous also about the cost of moving as well as the cost of living. Um, I live in Redwood City and so I'm able to take the commuter train, um, which Stanford is really generous and offers um, you a free pass to be able to commute in that fashion. Um, so I'm about an hour uh, train ride to San Francisco when I have weekends off. I love to go up there and enjoy spend timing, uh, spending time at the museums. Um, um, I'm also about a 20 minute drive to all three of the different hospital sites that I have to rotate at. Um, and I find that a pretty easy commute, easy to find parking, don't have any additional fees uh, incurred from that. Um, I think rent um, and living expenses are actually rather proportional to what I was spending over on the East Coast. And I think that things like the moving uh, stipend or relocation fee uh, stipend as well as the um, monthly housing allocation has also been really helpful. So I feel like I'm very comfortable. Um, I live in a one bedroom apartment with my partner um, and we find it very spacious and comfortable. So, so I'm a little biased because I was over at San Francisco for four years. So moving down to uh, Redwood City was actually a little cheaper. Um, but I, uh, it's a little different because I live with my, I married and my husband is a hospitalist um, here at Stanford as well. So we, um, so we rent a one bedroom apartment over at Redwood City and I would say it was cheaper than when we lived in San Francisco. Uh, but again, the, uh, the housing stipend, the stipend we get, the education stipend, the cell phone stipend, I think those all help a lot. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Gladys. Uh, Henry, I got you on the phone. Any thoughts on uh, cost of living in the Bay Area? If I moved here from Florida, where we don't have, where we did not have a state income tax, so you know, in my even in Miami, your salary as a resident went pretty far. I live in a small studio in Palo Alto that you can uh, drive a short distance to or bike to. But I know some people live as far away as the East Bay, as Pleasanton, but obviously the farther you go, the longer the commute is, but there is a cheaper, but you can get more for your money. Obviously there will be challenges if you have children, you may have to pay for their schooling, then their daycare. Um, but I do think that, you know, it is the salary that they give us does allow you to live, possibly live in the Bay Area, maybe not within, as they said, it's close to a Stanford University or hospital, but I think it is doable. But Thanks a lot, Henry. Um, I'll just add uh, that uh, for many of you who are applying for fellowship, it's often said that a lot of times where you end up doing your fellowship is a good chance you may end up staying. And we've seen that a lot here at Stanford where people come here and they don't want to leave uh, because they enjoy living here so much. Um, and I can tell you from a, a faculty standpoint, the university and the school of medicine is very supportive as well. So if you do end up training here and end up wanting to stay here for a good part of your career, the uh, programs uh, here at Stanford will actually help you buy a house, ton give you tons of uh, support from interest-free loans, low interest loans, uh, increase in salary. Um, there's a lot of different benefits that Stanford offers. And it's a bit of a theme when it comes to Stanford. There's lots of different support in many different ways. And a big one is housing, particularly for faculty. Um, I can tell you, I, I'm, I'm not a, a fellow here. I was not a fellow, but as a resident living here, I lived in Redwood City, not in the Stanford housing. And, um, I, we get paid pretty well in trainees and it's gone up a lot since I trained that I was paying off a lot of my loans while I was still training here. So it's something that's really important to the uh, leadership here. And we're always looking at ways to make sure that uh, the, the trainees here are supported and, and cost of living is a big one. Uh, BJ or any, uh, Abraham, any other thoughts? BJ, any thoughts? Once you match here, trying to find out in the local area in terms of what the best parts are. And so it's been incredibly helpful to connect uh, future fellows with our current and past fellows and our other trainees. We also have a pretty active uh, Facebook group where all the trainees talk to each other. So that's another way to find, uh, you know, the best places to live in. And uh, I think a couple of our fellows were actually able to find housing on campus. That's not that easy. Uh, but having said that, you apply for it and once in a while, you know, it turned out to be really uh, wonderfully surprised. So uh, I think that from the outside, it might look more harder than it actually is. And the other piece of it is the weather is always amazing. So it's really, uh, you'll, the benefits, they uh, outweigh the, you know, any uh, stresses that people might have. I mean, what do you think the, uh, you consider the biggest strengths of the Stanford culture? Abraham, you're alluding, you wanted to start with that? Yeah, I, I'm, you know, I, I've been at uh, several different medical schools, maybe seven over the course of my career. And I must say the most striking thing to me is the fact that at this university, all the other schools are on the same campus law, 
business, education, arts and sciences. And, you know, they're not across the freeway. They're not across the state. They're right here. And I think that's had a palpable effect, certainly on my scholarship, but I also see it as uh, very attractive to anybody training here. Uh, you cannot help but be much more aware of the larger world of cultural things that are happening, of other science and research going on. And it's um, really benefited all of us. So I think that's the biggest uh, asset to, to being at Stanford and making that, and the thing that makes the culture so different. Also, I like to think that um, you know, we're not giant. We're a fairly big department of medicine, but we're not as big as they come. And that creates a kind of intimacy, I think, a kind of a sense of a, a family that I think we take a lot of effort to foster. So that's part of the Stanford culture, I would say. I, I, I would like to echo that tremendously. That certainly helped. We got a huge NIH grant for the Stanford Diabetes Research Center as a result of having all of these collaborative environments. Um, and the other, the other thing which I was going to mention is we are sort of the only uh, university that I am aware of that does clinical trials with almost every major diabetes technology company. And I'm using that as an example, but you know, our partnership with industry and startups in the Bay Area is something that really can't be matched elsewhere. Um, having spent uh, the first part of my career at an East Coast institution, the last seven years here at Stanford, what have I observed? Um, it, this is a culture steeped in collegiality and collaboration. And I think Abraham's right. The, the seven schools being on campus facilitates that. Uh, but there has been a longstanding commitment to lower the barriers to collaboration, including across schools. Um, from the highest levels of the university. And I, and I, I think that, that sense is palpable. As Abraham says, the, we are still a small university, uh, although we've gotten bigger over the course of uh, the last several years. Uh, by Department of Medicine standards, we're a faculty of about 600. Uh, many of our peers have faculties over 1,000. And so we're deep enough to cover all the specialties and deep enough to cover broad areas of science. Um, as well as clinical medicine, but not so uh, broad that you don't get to know everybody. And I think that's really important. And then Rehan mentions, I think, one of our other key attributes, and that's our proximity to uh, uh, the, the center of America's technology innovation and in Silicon Valley and South San Francisco. It really is a great time to be here. Uh, whether you work in the biosciences or you work in um, more of the physical sciences and engineering, this is a great place to be. Uh, the, the technology companies are all moving into biomedicine and, uh, and the traditional biomedicine companies are embracing technology. And if you're at Stanford with a great engineering school, a great medical school, and in particular, a great interface between computer science and clinical medicine, this is just a spectacular time to be here if those are the kind of things that interest you. So I've only been here what, four months now, um, and I, you know, mostly inpatient, but I would say specifically for my program, um, everyone, it's, it's a smaller program, but I feel like everyone is so, um, so on top of your career, like everyone cares about where you're going, everyone cares about your uh, your future and I've noticed that they uh, you know they always reaching out to me knowing wanted to check on me just how I'm doing physical uh, wellness wise or they always check on me to see where my projects are going so I really like that and it felt uh, it feels like you know someone really cares for me um, and my in my success I find the culture of Stanford to be very supportive and inclusive um, I want to just echo a lot of what Gladys has already said you know I feel like as a first year fellow um, it's definitely a rough transition um, but I've been really impressed with and very much so appreciated how much faculty they go out of their way to really you know find time to meet with you and offer themselves as mentors um, and I think that given that I made such a, a big move, um, you know, having faculty who sort of break down the walls, break down the barriers and take the initiative to reach out to you and invest in you and ask you, what do you want to do with your life? Um, and then even beyond that, just really, uh, 
at caring how you're doing overall, your mental health and your wellness, um, you know, give, giving recommendations for fun things to do, places to eat, um, ways to get your mind off of, off of stressful um, situations and debrief and things like that um, has been really valuable um, to me. So I, I find that the culture here has really embraced me um, and I'm really, really grateful for that. Uh, how much time is spent at each of the three hospitals? Um, I'm this is Henry from Palliative Care. Um, so we work at our um, at Palliative Care Fellowship. We actually go to quite a few different sites. Um, we work at Stanford Hospital, the Palo Alto VA, uh, Santa Clara Valley, and of course a variety of different outpatient clinics and things like that in the area. And traveling between the sites is you know, it is something that you should consider. So that's why many of us have chosen to live kind of in the South Bay area between either San Jose and Mountain View. So that way you can kind of, either depending on where you're going and the time of day, you can really be against traffic as you're driving. And I do think the great thing about working at different sites is that the South Bay is, you know, don't, is a very diverse area socioeconomically. Um, and culturally, and by working at different sites, for instance, at Stanford Hospital, you're going to get a different pa patient population than you do at Santa Clara Valley, and then, then you get the Palo Alto VA, and I just feel, and I don't really, because I live in Palo Alto, I don't think traffic is that bad, because I, it's a central location where you're kind of going against traffic when you go to our, all our different sites. So I think, um, theoretically, this was one of the biggest strengths of the program, and one of the things that drew me. Um, to this program was the, the, the opportunities and the different pop patient populations that the three hospitals offered. Um, I was wondering, you know, like you are, um, logistically how that would play out, and I've been really pleased with how manageable it's been. Um, so, I, for example, this morning I just got back from my uh, pulmonary continuity clinic at Santa Clara Valley. It takes me from Palo Alto in the morning about 25 minutes to get there, 25 to 30, and 25 to 30 to get back. Um, it's the reverse commute coming from Palo Alto and generally coming from the north. Um, and if you know, if, if you match here, you can kind of ask um, fellows who you know experienced fellows about you know what the commute actually looks like. But it's very doable. And then the Palo Alto VA is obviously you know uh, pretty analogous to Stanford in terms of the logistics. Um, and I think that you know the patient populations are just fantastic. Um, I have been su surprised at how diverse the population of patients at Stanford Hospital um, is, has been, and, and that's been something that I've really enjoyed. Um, I think I, 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 one of my concerns as I came in or worries was, you know, I, I think I had this image of, you know, the canonical Palo Alto 30 to 50 year old tech um, technology employee, and I was worried that the hospital would be full of only that sort of patient. But it, it actually does draw from a very large, um, a very large area, including the the valley and um, and and patients from from Paul, uh, from the South Bay and the East Bay. So you do get very uh, diverse population here. But then, particularly at um, at Santa Clara Valley, it's you know a very Im immigrant heavy hospital, and it's just a really wonderful place to um, surround yourself with with people from different cultures. Uh, EVA, I've noticed you've uh, left the darkness of your car and have come outside in front of Santa Clara Valley, Valley Medical Center. Thank you for uh, actively demonstrating the answer to this question by showing your commute to us. I imagine you have some stuff to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, sorry. I had like kind of poor reception over there. So I wanted to get over to Valley. But yeah, I, I'm actually um, um, I agree with a lot of what the other fellows had said. My first year I lived in Redwood City. And um, by the time you really need to come to work, you're going to miss traffic. And you're also going to stay late most of the time. And you're going to miss traffic for, for the most part. But um, I would say all you need to do is just plan a little bit and you know, you'll be fine. And the nice thing about Stanford is if you live relatively close, Redwood City, Mountain View, you're usually against traffic when you're going to other places. So you'll be against, even if you're traveling during rush hour, you're oftentimes against traffic. Right at 5 p.m. if you're going to San Jose and coming back in the evening, you actually won't have traffic. So it's a, it's a bit of a plus um, working at Stanford in that respect. I would like to know some of your favorite outdoorsy weekend activities? Well, I'm still exploring the Bay Area myself, but I just walk around the, the complex or like my apartment complex and 
just jog around the trails by my apartment in Newark. Um, I have also gone to the city from time to time, but I am also hoping to do the boat rides and the boat tours because I, I used to live in Chicago and that was one of my favorite things to do was be outside on the water and go along the Chicago River. So um, I've heard that the, that the boat tours are really fun, especially with Alcatraz and yeah. And then I also heard that hiking is actually really, really good out here, but I haven't quite tried it. So I can add on to this. Um, I'm a very outdoorsy person and I think being outdoors is kind of my favorite thing to do when I'm outside of work. So um, here in Palo Alto, there's just so much um, in the way of opportunity. There's about um, seven open space preserves within like a 20 minute drive radius, um, which is fantastic. So these, most of these preserves, um, at least two of which are here in Palo Alto, offer tens of miles of trails. Um, and so, you know, you can go on, you know, a, a two to 15 mile hike without, you know, driving more than 20 miles from Stanford Hospital. Um, even with like a busy first year fellow schedule, I'm able to go trail running, um, you know, usually two or three times a week after work just because it's so close. Uh, and that's something that I've really, really enjoyed. And then obviously if you go further off, um, there's a lot of, um, you know, Yosemite is four hours away, um, which is, you know, will get you into the Sierra, which is some of the best, you know, the best country around. Um, so, and then you can go to the North Bay and there's, there's just a ton um, you know, if you're into hiking or, or running or walking, um, there's, there's all sorts of things. And then you can kind of go boating in the bay. So there's, there's a lot of opportunities. I think this is actually, a, this is a mecca for outdoors. So if, if that's one of your interests, you will be very, very happy here. Yeah, I really want to echo that. Um, as a GI fellow, I have every other weekend off. Um, on the weeknights, you know, if I'm able to get out early enough, I've really enjoyed exploring some of the trails near the hospital, especially um, when I'm at the VA. Um, a couple weeks ago, I had the opportunity to go hiking in Yosemite and then camped out near Mono Basin, which is really, really stunning. Um, and it was really nice to, it's really nice to know that with my time off, you know, just a couple of days, it's totally doable to just, you know, get away, um, just have so many options within, you know, 15 minutes, half an hour, a couple of hours, um, if that's your thing. So you definitely will have time for that. And there's a, a multitude of options. No, I think the fellows have uh, hit upon the key thing, which is that uh, my, my family and I like to hike in all the surrounding areas. We love Yosemite. And, uh, but you don't have to go far. The dish is a great hike, uh, just very, very uh, proximate to campus. So a lot of outdoor time. Um, uh, you know, and it's really 12 months a year of outdoor time. There's very, very, very little time that you can't be outside. So those of you who like outdoor life, this is the place to be. What support is available for Stanford regarding research when do it, when uh, do uh, visa constraints? Uh, T32 grants are not available. Are there internal grants or possibly uh, be included in the grant of faculty researchers? This is a great question. Um, I think one of the things to keep in mind is that with a T32, right, doesn't pay your whole, whole salary. So there's still a little additional uh, amount that one has to get funded. But the benefit of being at Stanford is the number of internal grants that we offer uh, is really amazing. And I had the fortune of uh, being on a Stanford maternal uh, child and child health research institute grant, which actually uh, not only paid better than a T32, but actually got me the health benefits of GME. So uh, that was actually super helpful. And we have a ton of uh, such grant opportunities um, here, which you won't necessarily get at every institution. And so just having a T32 doesn't necessarily mean you have everything in place for your research career. Um, but all that being said, we offer amazing other opportunities. And if you're on the post uh, doc or, uh, and graduate mailing lists, you can learn a lot about these other opportunities. Stanford puts a great deal of emphasis on um, funding research, including starting research careers from, I will say, every level, the university, the school, the department, and the various divisions. 
there's a lot of different opportunities. A great example was given of the Maternal and Child Health Research Institute, which is located on the in the pediatric healthcare system, but which encourages applications from different departments. Like many um, Stanford grants, there's the requirement of matching funds um, from some level from the home departments. And I think that's good. It gets everybody better connected. It puts everybody to have a little bit of skin in the game and to be highly supportive of, uh, of, uh, of the research um, enterprise. At the departmental level, we've also invested heavily in research infrastructure with the Stanford Center for Clinical Research, the Center for, um, for Digital Health, the Center for Population Health Science, uh, TRAM, which is our translational medicine, uh, centralized support system. There, there is a lot of support for, uh, for research at all different levels, but in particular for the early career, including trainees. Do you know the sense of how our support is for fellows who actually become faculty here? I'm frequently writing letters of support, et cetera, for um, various visa applications. You, you know, look, we're a global university. We want the most talented people from around the globe to come here to study, to teach, to learn, uh, to do research. And so we do spend a great deal of energy trying to create an environment where um, those needs can be met. I feel that there are so many resources for people who have budding research careers, absolutely. Um, and that was one of my top two or three reasons for uh, selecting Stanford. And I was lucky to, to get my, my number one choice. So I'm, I'm really, um, really thankful for some of the faculty and their mentorship. But I think the research support obviously varies by your department. Um, I work under the nephrology department under Dr. Glenn Chertow. And, you know, in terms of funding, um, you know, I'm, I am actually under his grant and they do match us by PGY level. So I understand that it could be different depending on your department. So I'm actually paid per my PGY level. Um, even if a grant is not successful, I, I get all of the benefits of any of the kind of ACGME um, kind of insurance and all those, all those other benefits. So that's the first part. Um, the second thing is there's, there are a lot of resources. I know that Stanford has offered a lot of supplemental classes for people who are interested in applying for NIH or ASN grants. So NIH, you guys are familiar with. I worked, I had applied for NIDDK um, kind of T32 uh, research proposal and grants. There are formal classes that help you literally walk you through the application process. And for people who may not be familiar with some of the the nuances of that, um, that's extremely helpful. Uh, so we literally went through the application process and then completed part of the application during this class or, or seminar. So there are a lot of other grant writing. There are grant writing and there are other like, um, like junior faculty developmental support programs and seminars throughout the entire university. So I definitely feel supported. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. And I'll just add, um, I'm new on faculty after graduating 28th grade here. So MedPeds Endo takes a long time to finish, unfortunately. But that being said, um, I actually, with that much time, was able to put together a K-23 application for myself. And then at the same time, my division was so supportive, they actually put together a K-12, which is an institutional training grant, uh, which actually supported two of us this year. So um, you're, you're, you know, the people here can be your best friends when it comes to getting things moving and pushing things in the right direction for you. So if you have that support within your department and your division can get stuff like that done. I also wanted to add that I, the cross-departmental cross collaborations is also a large, large part of this, either clinically or research-wise. Um, I know for myself, I, as you know, I have interest in women's health, so I, I have been able to connect with people in the ob department. Um, also, within my department in nephrology, we also have um, several biostatisticians. Literally, each, each um, research project has at least one to two biostatisticians within our department that's assigned to us. 
Okay, so we have a lot of the statistical support and I know in nephrology, we are really encouraged to uh, pursue the master's in clinical epidemiology as well um, for those who want um, more rigorous training or even PhD work actually. So I just wanted to make sure that that was also communicated as well. Hi, I'm one of the ID applicants from Baltimore. I was wondering what changes one should expect from moving from this coast to the west. Very good question. Yeah, maybe I can I can sure. take a leap because I actually, uh, as a fellow many years ago in infectious disease, I interviewed both in Boston and here, and I was struck by how laid back it was here. Um, the chief uh, resident had a ponytail, or the chief fellow had a ponytail, and he called the chief by his first name and. Um, I was almost taken aback by that. And then I went to Boston and it was completely the opposite. And I picked Boston, but not because of any of those reasons, only because there was no such thing as a match day. And uh, you know, a big famous person in Boston called me up and offered me this, this fellowship. And I didn't know if I would get another shot. So I said, yes. Um, but I must say the culture shock for me was going to the East Coast in the first place. I felt that, you know, um, it felt, it took a year for me to get past what I often would construe as being, you know, abruptness or even rudeness, which it wasn't. It just appeared that way. So my sense is that when you come this way, uh, you're in for a very pleasant surprise. Uh, I think you'll find that people are genuinely nice and are not shy about expressing it. So I think it'll be a welcome transition. What do you What do you think, Bob? Well, I, I was going to chide you, Abraham, that you might be the only one who's formally dressed today, that uh, the rest of us are in our West Coast garb without ties uh, for the men. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think I see at least one fleece amongst the fellows in resident, which is the preferred over the white coats. Um, you no, know, it, it is a different environment. I spent most of my career in the East Coast. And when I came here, I wore a tie every day. The second year I was here, I took my tie off on Friday. And <laughs> the third year I was here, I stopped wearing ties. Um, and now the only time I wear a tie is when I'm on the East Coast, when I go to Washington or uh, go to some national meeting. So it, it is a different environment here. It's a lot more laid back. And if you're coming from Baltimore, we can promise you the weather will be a lot better. I'm actually a New Yorker, but I spent, and I also did medical school and residency in the South. Um, it's definitely a different culture compared to the South and the East. I do, I agree with everyone else that it's definitely, everyone loves their Patagonias and people aren't as abrupt or as in your face about their opinions and their thoughts, which is a definitely a big difference than the East Coast. And it's definitely di much, much more different than the South. Here in the West Coast, everything is, everybody really expresses their thoughts to you in a very nice and constructive way. When I was in, in New York for medical school, I came and did a rotation here uh, as a medical student, a rare rotation. And I thought all the medical students were residents or, or older because all the medical students here wear long white coats. It's one of the few places, maybe the only place I know that the medical students wear long white coats. They're given coats. They actually, the only way you can tell the medical students is because their name is engraved on their white coat. The residents of fellows don't typically have that unless a family member did it for them. And uh, I, to me, it always, uh, more than the white coat, it was more about how we treat trainees here, uh, specifically medical students. And I think it says a lot about how we treat people here and uh, implications down the line with burnout and those types of things. I, I feel and I believe that our trainees are happier than anywhere else because we respect them as much as anywhere else, if not more. Would you please address Stanford's strategic plan to retain underrepresented fellows on faculty? Really great question. I, uh, I can tell you a, a few of the leaders on this uh, video chat with us today are some of the many key people who uh, val value diversity more than anybody, including our chairman. And uh, we've done a ton of stuff in that respect. Maybe Dr. Harrington, I might have you um, lead, answer that question first. Well, I'm hopeful that Vijay is still on because she really should have a, uh, a go at this since she's been one of the real uh, diversity and inclusiveness um, leaders. But yeah, we recognize that we are only going to be an excellent department and an excellent institution if we have an environment of diversity and inclusivity on campus. Uh, we won't be excellent without that. And so as a department, we've spent a great deal of energy on this, uh, both on gender uh, diversity as well as diversity more broadly defined. Um, I th as many on the phone know that we've, uh, across the department, we have a series of diversity liaisons that are on every search committee uh, to make sure that we're casting the broadest, pop uh, the broadest possible net for a really excellent diverse pool of candidates as faculty members. 
uh, we take that uh, very seriously. And if you look at our statistics, um, it's borne out over the last uh, four or five years where we've really increased the diversity of our faculty. So really important, some formal programs put in place. We measure ourselves, we're transparent with those measurements and, uh, and we respond to those measurements as, they, uh, as we look at the data. But maybe Vijay can, uh, can speak about this because she's been a real leader in the area. Thank you for that, um, uh, Bob, and I, I completely agree. We really think about it as diversity, uh, equity, and inclusivity. So those three things go hand in hand, and I think we get support at every level. We get support from our chair, as you obviously saw, Dr. Abraham Rakeez, so again, is an um, internationally known person who's been doing a lot of work with uh, supporting diversity. We get support from the dean's office. Bonnie Maldonado is our um, dean for um, diversity and leadership, so we get support from there. We have specific centers that are really focused on uh, helping underrepresented uh, investigators, training them, recruiting them, grooming them, and then uh, helping them into faculty positions. And as Dr. Uh, Harrington was saying, we think about diversity in a very broad context because we know that our differences make us stronger. So beyond our own university, the Bay Area is an incredibly diverse place. So you can't have only university diversity or only department diversity, but nested in a community where it's not that diverse friendly, but what you will find is when you come in with your family, you'll find that uh, this, this is a, one of the you know, amazing crucibles of innovation in the entire world, I think, especially because of our diversity. So it's something that we welcome, we groom, we support, and we celebrate. So if diversity is an important consideration to you, this is absolutely the best place to come to, and we'd be delighted to have you here. Thank you, Vijay. Uh, Abraham? Yeah, I think, um, you know, just to echo uh, a comment I heard earlier, people often have the perception that Palo Alto is a very homogenous, you know, uh, upscale up community, but actually we're a very diverse community. In East Palo Alto, we have a vibrant and rich African-American community in San Jose, a very vibrant Hispanic and immigrant community. And between the three hospitals, you're exposed to a very, very diverse group of patients. Uh, but I also wanted to add that um, as we try to recruit faculty uh, and improve diversity in our faculty, one of the most natural places for us to look is within the fellowship program. Because as Errol mentioned, so many fellows wind up staying here. And so if we do a good job of recruiting diverse fellows, that's one of the most important ways that we, you know, that we create diversity in the faculty. And I don't mean, uh, I mean, not just, you know, in terms of minorities and so on. I mean, in uh, in terms of gender and sexuality, in every way, uh, a diverse faculty is reflective of a diverse fellowship and a diverse residency and medical school and so on. So it goes all the way up and down. And I'll just add, um, Bob touched on this earlier. Uh, one of the things that our department does, that Bob does, is, is, and he mentioned this, is we are extremely transparent. We actually, in the state of the department lecture that Bob gives every year, He'll put up the slides and show where we are in regards to gender and uh, in every way diversity and show those numbers and show where we're going and where we want to be. And uh, it's probably one of the most powerful things that we do is, is we let everybody know what we're doing. It really motivates us to make sure we address any issues. So we've had a lot of change over the years and it's really important to us. Thank you for that great question. I'll say that where I went to medical school, um, I actually never, well, I was very hesitant about going into GI because I didn't see anybody that looked like me. There were no women and there were no people of color in the entire department. So I just kind of assumed as a medical student that I would be the only lonely unicorn if I decided to go into GI. Um, and so I have to say that being here at Stanford, this is the most diverse faculty I've ever been, uh, had the privilege of learning from and working with, um, diverse in every way imaginable. Um, and I really love the moments where I get to talk to my attendings when we're working together and learn more about how they grew up, um, you know, whether they came from means or without, or, um, and just some of their cultural traditions and heritage and practices. Um, and I felt, I felt very embraced and able to talk about 
my um, Buddhism and, you know, my political leanings and just, I don't know, I feel like there's just a, a really rich community here and diversity of thought, diversity of experience, and people are open and willing to talk about and share those things. Um, and so I have, I have felt really comfortable and at home. And I can say that at every step of my training, I <laughs> almost didn't think it was possible. So um, if those are the kinds of things that matter to you, then I think you will be um, in good company here. So actually my experience has also been really great. I'll just be honest, I don't feel judged at all by, you know, uh, you know, skin color necessarily. Um, I think it's overall, I, I think diversity is certainly embraced. And I agree, Stanford is really a cosmopolitan kind of environment in terms of how people definitely in people's backgrounds and how they grew up and their thought process. I mean, I'm a girl also from small town, Wisconsin. I have, you know, West African uh, parents. Um, so I was a little bit concerned, like, oh my goodness, am I going to be alone? Because I have to start over and build my own community. That was something I was really concerned about. But I'm, I'm happy. All of my needs are met. And, you know, I've gotten to meet people of different backgrounds than than myself i mean i in college i actually studied mandarin and i've gotten to relearn or brush up on my mandarin actually just because of the obviously the patient population and and um, faculty and residents that are here so you know i think overall people can find connections in all sorts of different ways so i'm, I'm actually really proud and happy here uh, there are a few uh, questions. I think that um, in the interest of time, we might want to quickly answer. Yeah, um, thanks, Vijay. So uh, I think an important one here that a lot of the fellows, uh, prospective fellows want to know is how uh, does Stanford do with hiring faculty? We want to recruit an excellent faculty, and I can't think of a better pool of excellence than our fellows and our residents. So uh, we, as, um, as Errol and others have already indicated, we do hire a lot of our own residents. Uh, we hire a lot of our own fellows. We, we, we tend to, we, we, we have great success in hiring people who've had some sort of Stanford connection. Maybe you were an undergrad here, went away to get uh, medical education and training and want to come back at some point. Uh, that works very well for us as well. Uh, one of the reasons for that is, is that it, if you have knowledge of the Bay Area, you tend to be excited about returning to the Bay Area. So yeah, we, we hire a lot of people from our own programs um, because they're excellent. Yeah. Anecdotally, I've been here for about 11 years. And in general, if a fellow is a Stanford fellow and they want to stay here, they usually can. It's, less, it's more about whether they just prefer to go somewhere else for more training or for other reasons. But uh, we, we aim, I, I, the program aims to keep fellows here and, and a lot of people do choose to stay here and have no problem staying here if that's what they choose to do. How hard is it for residents and fellows to have access to good football seats? <laughs> well, the last few weeks, the stadium's been almost empty, so uh, I'm guessing not hard. <laughs> yeah, let's, hope for a better, let's hope for a better year with the new fellowship group. <laughs> <laughs> um, There's a question on global health. There is a, one of the participants wants to find out about uh, Stanford's global health program, and I'll say that Michelle Berry, who is a Senior Associate Dean for Global Health, is an international leader. And so there are tremendous opportunities for uh, fellows and trainees to be involved in um, uh, global health initiatives, be it by the way of research or if you wanted to rotate out. For example, in our own fellowship, fellows have rotated in Malaysia and Africa. Henry, who's on, is interested in going to Canada. And uh, because we have such wonderful connections, and uh, as the world is shrinking with, the, um, uh, with all the uh, internet-based uh, engagement, I think global health is incredibly important. And so this is a really wonderful place if people want to um, train in any kind of global health, either clinical or uh, research. I wanted to know, as fellows, are there committees, events for interdepartmental networking? It's a great question. I think that's for Abraham to talk about the fellow college and how uh, yeah. we connect across. Yeah, I actually want to just compliment the fellows who are on this call because, you know, in the midst of your busy schedules for you to take time like this is really uh, wonderful to see. And I think we recognize that when fellows come from a big family residency program where it really feels like a family, you've gotten to know them for three years, 
and then you come to a division and you might be one of two or three fellows, it's very easy to feel lost. And uh, I'm so proud of our fellows. Uh, a couple of them took the initiative to come to us and, you know, gave us this idea for forming a sort of community of fellows college. And so we have a series of events uh, lined up. But the first one was that we had a reception on the very second or third day of your fellowship. And all the fellows from all the programs came together and I'm told that many of them are so fast friends. So everything we can do to build community, because I think it is challenging remembering my own fellowship, landing up in a new city, knowing just a few people. And I think part of the reason we have so many wonderful fellows on this call is they recognize the importance of this. And uh, uh, hopefully you'll find a very different experience here than I think in many other places. I'll say so that um, something that I was very, uh, unique that I found here in my fellowship is that there's this program called LEAP, um, which stands for Leadership Education and Advancing Diversity. And it's a, um, it's for all the fellows and residents um, of different diverse backgrounds. Uh, you meet monthly and you learn about different topics and diversity and they have different speakers. And you also learn how to do a workshop. So at the end of the year, um, you're, you're considered a lead scholar. And at the end of the year, you do a workshop on a topic that your group is interested in um, based on a di topic of diversity. And I found that very meaningful because you get a huge group of people. There's over 100 participants um, who have this uh, interest in diversity. And um, they bring multiple speakers. You, I feel like you learn a lot of skills. And you get to know fellows and residents from the different divisions. So um, that's something very meaningful that I enjoy it a lot and it's um, time commitment is just once a month and uh, you get to bond with different people across the different uh, fellowships. We've been doing a fellow college for about the last two or three years. That's really been a good experience. Um, it allows us all to talk with one another, meet people um, in, our, in our same PGY level and uh, you know from that uh, we've actually started having little meetups and MedPeds meetups for if any of you out there are, uh, are MedPeds, we have a little conglomerate over here now. Um, and it's just really nice to be able to, to chat and, and work with so many wonderful people here. Thanks so much, Rand. Guys, as we close, um, thank you to all the attendings um, for joining us. As we finish, uh, maybe I could go around and ask each fellow maybe in a sentence or two, there's any parting wisdom. You just went through this whole process that all these attendees are, are listening to learn more about. Um, what wisdom would you share with them? I was nervous you were going to say that. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is pick Stanford number one. I did, and I am not disappointed. I'm having the best time of my life. I am learning a lot. Um, I've been here, you know, for, what is, is it, like four or five months now? Oh, my God, time is flying. Um, but I've learned so much. I feel like mentors... Um, give you space to grow, autonomy. Um, yeah, I'm really happy. Pick Stanford. I think you can get a great, you can get great training in a lot of places, uh, but I think it's so important to find someone, a mentor, someone that you think you can work with. Um, maybe even reach out to them before you uh, come to fellowship or choose your fellowship, because I think, you know, aside from the training, you'll get great training here, but you also want to know there will be mentors for you. Um, uh, if you have some specific um, research interests. I just wanted to add as, as some sort of a non-traditional applicant here doing adult and pediatrics, this was the one place where I felt like everyone was willing to go out of their way to make it happen. One of the things that was important for me in picking Stanford was kind of looking for a place with a diverse diversity of opportunities. And I think Stanford absolutely has that. Um, you know, I think uh, Gladys comes as maybe someone who's slightly more differentiated in terms of what they want to do. And I think if, if that's you, that's great. You can seek, a, seek out a mentor and talk to them um, kind of straight off the bat. But I think for me, I was a little bit less certain about what I wanted to do in terms of my research interests. And Stanford was really appealing because you do get here and get the sense the sky is the limit. You know, you have um, the kind of all of Stanford University at your fingertips. There's a million labs. There's, you know, a million courses. If you feel that, you know, you have, like for me, it's been partially about identifying kind of knowledge deficits and then ways to, to fix them, you know, and, and Stanford University is a fantastic resource for that. And similarly, Silicon Valley um, offers a great resource for other folks. You kind of have such a great set of opportunities here and, and it, that it can be great if you have a sense of exactly 
exactly what you want to do. And I would say just know yourself and understand your values. One good thing about coming to Stanford is that if you want to come, if you come here, there's a wealth of resources to help you with mentorship and also developing a professional network, especially if you choose to remain in the area. And even if you don't, there's always Stanford, the Stanford name goes fine. There's a lot of people that have trained here that are across the country and the world that can always help you and be there to help you, you know, mentor you, guide you and help you improve your career. BJ, any parting words of wisdom? The fellows have said it so beautifully. I have nothing to add. Oh, thank you. Abraham, anything else? And Bob? No, just maybe hope that we see some of you here next year. Hope that we see some of you here next year. <laughs>